We all know that organic content marketing and SEO is one of the most important growth channels for SaaS today. It's a real struggle for most growing SaaS companies to find the internal bandwidth to get all the content done that you need for your SEO. Plus, how do you prioritize your actions to get the fastest path to results? The trick is finding the right agency to partner with. And that's why today's sponsor is Flying Cat Marketing. I really like the way they approach SEO and content marketing. They're full service and they have content experts, technical SEO experts, and a team of absolute rock stars. But what I really love about their approach is the following. They have a process for working with internal experts so their content sounds like it's written in-house. They follow a proven framework, which means they get results way faster than any regular in-house team. And they do everything. They don't just provide you with the strategy and let you figure it out. They actually execute it for you and hold themselves accountable for results. Plus, they know B2B SaaS, which is what we're talking about today. Their clients include ActiveCampaign, Mixmax, Hotjar, and many other big names in SaaS. If you're ready to dip your toes into SEO and content marketing, please speak with them today at flyingcatmarketing.com. Hello, hello, everyone. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. In today's episode, we'll be talking about why founders should use a SaaS service for data protection and resilience. Today, we have our guest, W. Curtis Preston, joining us. W. Curtis Preston is also known as Mr. Backup, is the chief technical evangelist at Druva. They are a data protection as a service company. He is an expert in backup and recovery systems, a space he's been working in since 1993, where he designed data protection systems for some of the largest organizations of the world. He's also host of the Restored All podcast, founder and webmaster of BackupCentral.com, which is a website dedicated to talking about backup and recovery. And he's written four books about backup and recovery. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So welcome, Curtis, or W. Curtis. Uh, super excited to have you on, this, on the show today. <laughs> uh, always, always excited to talk about my favorite topic. Let's get into it. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. So um, maybe let's start off right at the top. Like why, you know, if I'm a SaaS, uh, if I'm any business and I, I need to use, I'm looking to, uh, to use a SaaS application, um, why do I have to, you know, look at using something that, you know, with the, the higher risk of data loss and consider this extra layer of protection and resilience, which, which you talk about? Yeah. So, you know, we, we protect, uh, you know, if you look at a typical organization, right, there's sort of three or four different areas where they need to worry about. They've got the, their data center that they may or may not still have. Mm -hmm. They may be using IAS services such as AWS. Uh, they may be using SaaS services like what you're talking about. And then there are also endpoints, such exactly. as laptops and phones, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when, you t when we talk about protecting SaaS, the, the primary challenge that I have when I'm talking to people that are using SaaS is that they think that data protection, that backup is part of the service that they're already paying for. And so too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to which I just want to say, uh, nope. Um, <laughs> it's just not right. there. <laughs> there. There are some, there are some exceptions. Hmm. Um, but for example, and, and, and a lot of people are surprised by that, right? Uh, well, Microsoft wouldn't, you know, wouldn't leave me in a lurch. Well, uh, you know, I don't want to speak ill of Microsoft, but there is nothing in your contract with Microsoft or with Google for uh, Google Workspace, for example. Um, th there is nothing in that contract that says that they're backing up your data. In fact, there's a lot of clauses that basically, um, you know, absolve them of any responsibility if something bad were to happen to your data. Now, they, they often, or, or sometimes, they sometimes have um, basically what I would call a DR copy that would only come into play if their entire data center, uh, is destroyed by fire, which, which has happened, right? That, and by the way, this isn't present in all SaaS services, but that's, if they have something that tends to be what they have, uh, but then they'll specifically state that that, uh, backup is not available to you. If you ask them, they won't. They're often not very upfront about that. The, they'll tell you that that's not available in a more general sense. So, for example, if you got attacked by, let's say, ransomware, which is you know the number one concern of everybody today, if you got attacked by ransomware and that basically wiped out your uh, Microsoft 365 instance, nothing that they have will be able to restore your data. Wow. Right? So you're paying um, a lot of money to AWS. You're paying a lot of money to Google and... Uh... Yeah, they're not. You know, the yeah. I guess there's a, some hidden hidden uh, hidden issues there that we're, we don't consider, right? Or 
yeah, that we think I, I don't tend to hear this assumption when we talk about AWS or or Azure or GCP. That's it's infrastructure, right? You're renting right. a VM, you're renting S3, or you're renting something like that. I don't generally get people assuming that that's protected, right? Partly, well, I, I'd say chiefly, because AWS is very upfront about it. There, mm. It's right in their documentation. Listen, you need to be backing this stuff up. Got it. Uh, sometimes they have backup systems that are integrated with some of their services, but then they'll tell you, this is only in that region in your account. You need to be copying it to somewhere else, right? Mm. Um, but but it's in the SaaS world, uh, such as okay. 365 or Salesforce or uh, uh, Google Workspace. Right. You used to be called G Suite, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's where there seems to be this assumption. Uh, and sometimes not just an assumption, but there are some people who are actively arguing against the point I'm trying to make, right? Okay. There are yeah. some who are actually experts in that tool and they'll say, oh, well, you could use this, this, and that. It's like, yeah, but those tools aren't designed to do what we're talking about. Right. right exactly. So, so for example, like um, retention policies is the the thing that people often bring up in my, uh, Microsoft 365. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with the retention policies. You can say every email, every document, every whatever is retained for 90 days, regardless mm -hmm. of whether we like it, don't like it, delete it, don't delete it, whatever. You can say that that you know that that's the case, and that's more of a like a compliance feature, right? Right, mm -hmm. uh, and more of an e-discovery feature because the way that you get stuff out of there, if it's not in the recycle bin, the way you get stuff out of there is you actually do an e-discovery case. So okay. it's more an e-discovery tool. It's not a backup tool, and you know, it, it, it's and it's like, um, you know, I don't know if you're. I'm, I'm a DIY guy, right? I literally, right. I don't know, 20 feet that way. I'm currently in the midst of uh, putting in my own new flooring. Uh, you know, I'm a DIY guy. It's helpful to have the right tool for the job, for right? Sure. Yeah. I could have a sledgehammer and I could nail in nails with a sledgehammer, <laughs> but it's a horrible, I, you can nail you can nail in nails with a, with a pair of vice grips if you really want to, but sure. it's a horrible way to do the job, right? So it, the same is true here. Got it. And then, so if I'm, uh, you know, looking at a, for some kind of robust data, you know, SaaS data protection solution, what are some, you know, basic features that I should be looking at? What should I be aware of and look, looking for? Because obviously, obviously, I thought it was included. Now I understand it's not. What, what, do I, what do I look that I don't know I should be looking for? Well, I mean, I would, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put out an opinion. Uh, <laughs> and then I, will, I will admit that this opinion is colored by the fact that mm -hmm. I work for a SaaS, a, a data protection company that is, that is, that is offered as a service, right? Um, to me, the thing that makes most sense when backing up SaaS is to use SaaS, right? It's, it's, a uh, it's SaaS to SaaS. It's, it's cloud to cloud. It, it makes sense. You're in the cloud. There are some solutions that run in the data center. Mm -hmm. What I would think one of the first things that you would look for is that your data protection system shouldn't be any harder to use than the system that you're protecting. Mm -hmm. You've already you've already moved to the cloud. You've already moved to SaaS. Mm -hmm. To me, it makes sense that you would want to be in the same century with your data protection system, right? You mm -hmm. would want mm -hmm. a system that understands cloud to cloud um, authentication, uh, that understands how to properly authenticate to it, and then understands you want the same things that you want in a regular backup system. So you want things like auto discovery. You know, I just want to give you one account and then have you find all my accounts. And then I either want to just say all or I just want to click on the ones that I, that I want to back up. And then what you want is you want a, a system that is aware of the challenges of backing up some of these tools. And again, I'll, I'll pick on Microsoft. Microsoft is notorious for their API limits. And if you're not, if you're not living within those limits, you can find yourself, um, basically, you can have a backup that's configured that won't run, right? I can think of a competitor that we have, and they're like, oh, well, we, we back up every five minutes, or we can back up every five minutes. To which I want to say, what does that do with the API calls, right? Because if you run out of API calls, you're not doing anything. 
right? Right. Um, so, and, and it can actually impact other parts of your organization because you, mm. the backup APIs often use the same APIs as other things. Um, so I would say just, just in general, um, making sure that the, the data protection system is, is as easy to use as the other one, as the service that you're backing up. And then also um, that it's, that it's build. I think it should be build similarly. Right, you're paying you're paying eight bucks a month to Microsoft. You should right. pay a couple of bucks a month for your backup system. Not oh well, it's thirteen dollars a gigabyte, and then, you know plus the API. That's complicated. It should just Got be it. it should be the same as as uh, you know what you're used to. Makes sense. And when I'm thinking about you know the overall kind of protection ecosystem of my data, the other side of it is also your protection of your privacy. Right. I mean, this is this is private. Right. You know, a little IP information here, what's the difference? How do you look at, you know, protecting your privacy versus just the data security when it comes to, to SaaS specifically? Well, you have to do both, right? Um, I, I should have, I mean, this is like, well, this is going to be the, well, yeah, duh category. One of those is encryption of the data in flight and encryption of the data at rest, right? So you need to make sure as a system that's storing data that can often be very private, you need to make sure that it is protected against, um, you know, things that might uh, damage it, either damage it or access it. Those are the two things, right? Um, and and when you look at some of these backup systems that are storing the data on-prem, you think about um, the fact that the number one target now of ransomware uh, companies, I hate calling them that, but they are essentially companies. Uh, so, for example, the Conti ransomware group, their number one target is now your backup system because they found that if you have a decent backup system, then they're, they're not going to get their ransom. So they go after the backup system first. And so uh, what I'm saying is that the privacy aspect could be um, is something you have to build into it to make sure that either <clears throat> the ransomware system uh, wouldn't delete private data that you're supposed to be holding on to or even even just as scary, access that, right? Exfiltrate that, and then use that as a different extortion technique to get you to give them money. Right. And then, so you mentioned on-prem. Um, I actually spoke with a, a SaaS company the other day, and they they talked about how they, you know, they don't trust kind of the online system, and they have they 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 decided that CTO said, look, we're going to set up a system, a traditional entire backup system in their in their mm -hmm. town. They're based in the in Netherlands. Um, what are the challenges or risk of using using that that kind of model backing up your data? Well, I'd say the number one is the one that I just mentioned, right? This idea of the the fact that here's here's the thing. So you mentioned that I've been in backup since '93, yeah. which means that in, in a few months I'll have been doing backups for 30 years. Uh, they should they should finish any day now. But I'm, anyway, <laughs> um, backup joke. Yeah. Anyway, I um. Th if you go back literally just to like two years um, and, and, and everything before that backups weren't the, they weren't on the front lines. They were, you know, you, you had to worry about fires and floods and hurricanes and earthquakes. And I grew up in Florida, so I had to worry about uh, right. sinkholes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, they get all all the good stuff in Florida with the hurricanes and the tornadoes mm -hmm. and the singles. Mm -hmm. um, the um, but the, nobody was concerned about the information security aspect of backups. Mm -hmm. But suddenly, that's moved to the to the front. That's one big change that's happened. But something right. else that hasn't changed is that nobody wants to be the backup guy, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how I got my job. 30 years ago <laughs> was the guy by the name of Ron Rodriguez didn't want to be the backup guy anymore. And so he gave it to me and, um, and I took it because I, it was the job I could get. Right. 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 And literally the only reason I ended up becoming an expert was just sort of happenstance. Um, I, like a lot of people, I actually tried to get out of backup. I just, <laughs> just get, it's like, like that line you keep you bring, you keep bringing me back in. Uh, but, um, <laughs> the, um, and so what, why does that matter? Well, what you have is often junior people running the backup system. And now this backup system is on the front lines of the attacks. 
And so uh-huh. you have people that aren't necessarily schooled in, in the world of privacy, in the world of security, in the world of watching and, and prepping for attacks. They, they may not know, they may not be that, uh, you know, anybody that's in IT, anybody that's using computers these days will know what MFA is. Mm-hmm. They might not know that it's called that. Right? They might not. They might not really realize. Well, maybe my backup system should have a, have a, an MFA to it, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe my maybe it's weird that my when I when I log in to administer my backup system, I log in as administrator, or I log in as root. Maybe that's weird. That's not good. Is that good? Right? They don't know to ask mm-hmm. these questions. These, these right. are things that a seasoned person would know already. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is the backup system needs to be on the front lines in terms of like the thing, you know, information security policies and practices and, 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 and patches and things like that. But it's going to be, it's more like, more than likely it'll be in the, in the back of that line. So it's not that you can't do uh, an on-prem backup system that secure. I just think it's, it's going to involve many pieces of technology. It's going to involve a lot of cutting edge security techniques. Uh, they're not that cutting edge like MFA and, and the concept of least privilege and the concept of, of role-based administration. But they're techniques that historically have not been applied to backup systems, right? Mm-hmm. So I would, you know, no disrespect to the, to the gentleman in, in uh, the Netherlands, by the way, great country. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would put the security of the average cloud service up against the security of the average data center mm-hmm. any day of the week. Really? Okay. Yeah. Any day of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and especially, especially, and then I make that times two when mm-hmm. we're talking about backups, right? Because you compare a system that nobody wants to administer. Nobody wants to be the one in charge of it. And so it, it just gets ignored. Uh, and it gets given to the junior person. And then as a result, it will be, in my opinion, much less secure. We'll, we'll comprise uh, of, of many individual vendors. You know, we, we call it the seven vendor problem because of okay. all of the different vendors that you're going to have to have in order to have a decently secure uh, backup system. <clears throat> okay. um, yeah, anyway. So no, that, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, there's also like the, the so you said the environmental risk, but then there's also the cost and the space you need to have and holding yeah. it up versus not even worrying about it. You know, everything's on the cloud and you can see it from your, from your phone. Right. And you don't even have to right. worry about maintaining the actual physical space. Yeah. So, you know, one thing is you mentioned as kind of a risk around, you know, deciding on, you know, the, the type of you know, backup as a service vendor you're working with was the experience of kind of the, 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 the technical folks behind it who are, who are safeguarding your, your data. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some other, you know, things you should be aware of when it comes to deciding, all right, should I work with, with your, with your team who has Mr. Backup or, you know, this other team in, in, I don't know, in, in, in the Ukraine who has maybe, maybe not today, wrong, wrong country to use, but you know, say like, <laughs> that was a bad example. <laughs> that was friend. a bad example. I will, okay. <laughs> I will say that the folks in Ukraine, it's funny yeah. that you mentioned that the folks mm-hmm. in Ukraine have actually gotten really good at restoring data. Right. Um, yeah. Because of everything that's happened, they, they are actually, sure. uh, and not just the recent, um, not just the recent part, uh, not just the recent stuff that's going on in the last, mm-hmm. what is it, about a year now? Mm-hmm. Um, but even before then, they had already been getting cyber attacked and okay. they, they actually got pretty good. But what okay. I would say what mm-hmm. I would say is this, um, when you're talking, if you're considering a SaaS data protection solution, which I really do think you should, I, I think it's just like everything else in IT, SaaS is the future for data protection. The cloud is the future for infrastructure and SaaS is the future for data protection of that same infrastructure. <clears throat> just makes sense to protect the cloud with the cloud. Just make sure it's not the same cloud. Make sure you don't keep everything in the same place, right? Okay. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean like AWS to AWS. It's just a matter of like picking regions and things like that. Mm, got it. Okay. Um, and accounts. Very, very important there. Um, look at the question that I would ask is whether or not this service that you're considering, is this the bread and butter of this company? Like as in, is this what they do all the time, you know, every day, 365 days a year? Or or is this their new hobby? 
Mm. And I say that because if you go back just like two years, uh, I've been at Druva now for uh, coming up on five years. By the way, my first vendor, I, I've been on the on the on the independent side and the and the helping you know people one one on one with backups uh, up until about five years ago. In the last two years, but before two years ago, we didn't have any competitors. Well, we had one. It was one SaaS-based data protection company. And then in the last year, all of the major on-prem companies have gotten into the SaaS business. And they've all done it in the same way, every single one of them. They have done what we call a lift and shift. You know the term lift and shift? No, I don't. So It's a cloud term. So basically take your VM and your storage, and you you move the VM from your data center up to a VM in the cloud. Poof, okay. you're in the cloud. Okay. That's okay. called lift and shift, right? Lift and shift, okay. It's a perfectly valid way to move into the cloud, but it's well acknowledged by anyone who's ever done anything in the cloud. It's also the most expensive way to get the cloud. Okay, right? interesting. Um, it, you, you go from essentially owning a car to renting a car that you're using every day. That that's it's essentially that's how the economics work. Okay. Um, the way the way the cloud makes a lot of sense. The way we implemented in the cloud, we designed for the cloud. We designed so that the that that infrastructure will go up and down throughout the day, and that um, basically it dynamically scales up and down. Why does that matter? Well, it saves us money. It saves you money, right? Um, we all of the services that we use, we don't have to do any block provisioning the way typical. Uh, typical backup services use block storage. You then that means you have to provision a bunch of storage in advance that you're paying for and you're not using. Um, whereas what we use is we use S3, mm. right? Um, and a lot of vendors that don't know what they're doing with S3, they well we don't use S3 because it's slow. S3 is only slow if you don't know how to use it, mm. right? If you store if you store servers as thousands of little objects in S3. And you ask for all thousands of those objects at once, watch how fast S3 will be, right? Mm. But if you put one big blob, which is the way most backup products work, put one big blob on S3, yeah, it'll be slow. Mm. Okay. So again, it's like, do these vendors, did they just do a lift and shift approach? Why does that matter? It matters because it makes it way more expensive for them. Why does that matter to you? If it's not more expensive, most of the time when we do a, a head-to-head -head comparison with another SaaS service, we will be yeah. less expensive than they are. Okay. If they're not, and it's a lift and shift vendor, they're they're using a loss leader approach. You're familiar with that approach? I'm not, no. Uh, so it, it, it means that, um, uh, actually, I was just watching mm -hmm. on the news this morning, uh, Costco. You know, Costco, yeah. and, the, and they have the $1.50 hot dog. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's like a loss leader. That caught that right. hot dog cost them more than that to to do, and they said that For they'll sure. never raise the price, no matter what their costs are, because exactly. basically it's something that sucks people into the store. Exactly. So if they're a, if they're a if they're a um, a lift and shift vendor, and their costs are similar to ours, or their cost to you is similar to ours, they're doing a loss leader approach, meaning they're losing money on your deal to Up keep front. your business right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that only lasts for so long. So that's true. I would suggest that you look at a vendor that's made the economics of the cloud actually work mm. and uh, and is that their entire business is based on that, right? Whereas, yeah. you know, again, I don't want to, I don't want to call names specifically, but all the big backup vendors suddenly have a SaaS service, mm. right? And they use it using the exact same technology they use on-prem. They just moved it into the cloud. Right. Which again, will work, but it will be very expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can I can uh, throw some names kind of in a different world when it comes to like web hosting. I've seen the same thing uh, where that happens where, you know, it's a $5 a month service and they're paying affiliates, you know, something like $200 to, you know, get a sign up. And well, what they know is, that, okay, once you migrate, the the chances and the lo lo like the probability that you're going to shift, is probably they, they know the, the calculations that they're probably going to stick around for five years, 10 years, and they're going to make up you know, $5,000 out of that. So that, yeah. that loss up front is probably worth it for them. And, and, and maybe that's and, what they're doing here, right? And backup is even worse than web hosting because with really? web hosting, mm -hmm. there there are ways you can migrate because web hosting, sure. you're just talking about your primary data. With that's backups, true. you're talking about history of data. So you're like, 
<laughs> well, I can migrate off of product X to product Y, but what do I do with all those product, all that stuff that in product Y? So you have to pay both of them for a time, right? right? That's, That's the way it generally works. And so, yeah, it's even stickier than the web hosting world. So maybe tell us a little bit more about that. That kind of what are the challenges, right? If I'm now looking to move from a large data center, and now I want to I want to go to the cloud, or I want to mm -hmm. implement this this uh, this backup solution which I don't have. Um, what 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 do I have to understand as a challenge and difficulties that I'm going to encounter here? other than the costs? Yeah, so the, the first, there are sort of two big challenges. First off, the, you know, you want to look at the ease of use. You want to look at how it's built. You want to look at what it's going to cost you. You want to look at what it's like to do business with that company. You want to look at all those things. Yeah. But when it comes down to just doing the job, mm -hmm. there are two primary challenges, and they're essentially the same challenge twice. And, and they're both, and it's because of physics, right? So the one challenge of backing up in the cloud is that first big backup and, and a big restore. So how do you deal with that? Um, the, the first big backup can be handled by a seeding tool. So like in our case, uh, if it's a customer that's like, let's say 100 terabytes or more, uh, we offer a, a free service. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's no additional cost. Uh, they, the, we, our infrastructure runs in AWS. We send you a, a box. Well, actually, AWS sends you a Snowball Edge box. It's already configured with our tech. And then you back up to that. You send it back to AWS and magic happens. They upload all your stuff. So that's that's a, a quick way to get that, that initial backup out of the way. The second is how do you handle a large restore? And um, there are three different ways to handle that, like with us. One is the reverse of what I just described. It's the It's the least, it's the worst way to do it because the AWS has to essentially restore your data onto a device. Then that device has to be shipped to you. Then you have to do the restore again, right? So it's, it's, it takes several days versus doing it dynamically. Okay. Um, the other way, and by the way, this is all assuming that you've, you've attempted the restore or tested a restore from the cloud and you're like, okay, that wasn't fast enough to do a direct restore from the cloud. I will say, most of our customers do direct restore from the cloud and they find it to actually be faster than many of their on-prem uh, choices. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. But let's say it wasn't fast enough. So the first is that reverse seeding is what we would call that. The second mm -hmm. is uh, we do offer for no extra charge. Uh, you can use an appliance of your choice to have a local copy of your data. Um, we don't, we don't charge extra for that. Um, and, and then the third, and I think the third and the best option is if you're talking DR, you should be doing DR in the cloud. Okay. So we can actually recover your entire data center um, in the cloud in 15 to 20 minutes, regardless of size, with an R with an RPO wow. of of one hour, right? So that's RPO is the, the amount of data that you lose, right? <clears throat> so we support a, an RPO of, a, of down to one hour. Wow. Um, the, the, and the and by the way, let's go back to this is why being in the cloud and understanding of the way the cloud works matters. The reason why we can recover a petabyte or more of a data center in 15 to 20 minutes, it's because we're built for the cloud. So what we do is we've got, again, we're using S3. All your stuff's already out there. We actually pre-restore the VMs uh, so that they're they're in a... They're in an EC2 snapshot format. We do that continually. <clears throat> you tell us how often you want to do that. Like you update it after every backup, update it once a week, once a day. You, you tell us, right? But we're, we update the image that's ready to go. And then in 15 to 20 minutes, let's say you got 2,000 VMs. We can tell AWS, hey, do the restore of those 2,000 EC2 snapshots. Do them all right now. And they'll do them all simultaneously. You wow. can't do that if you're thinking like an on-prem product, right? Exactly. So that's the kind of thing I think that that you can do. So th those are the two big challenges. Um, okay. The and then and then the other thing is to just make sure no one in the vendor's uh, environment should ever have the ability to touch your backups, touch okay. them in any way, right? Touch them. Uh, to, to do damage to them, touch them in um, uh, the ability to actually read them, um, you know, or, or delete them, right? 
Right. Basically, this is another problem with the lift and shift approach. Mm. If you did with the lift and shift approach, well, somebody's got root or administrator on that box that's actually the backup server. Who is that person? It's some random dude, right, mm -hmm. uh, running in that vendor, somebody that you don't even know who it is. Right. Um, so that, mm. you know, that's another problem with that lift and shift approach. Okay, no, that makes sense. I'll, I'll, so that's that's good to understand the challenges and, and what we're kind of going up against when we're, we're going, um, when we're, we're thinking about implementing the system. Um, I guess I want to wrap it up with a, with a final question before we get into the personal rapid fire, which is, Maybe we can talk about best practices of how we want to set, structure it and set it up. So we decide, okay, we want to move forward with you know your team or any of the the vendors out there. And now there's there's obviously cost involved, and there's different ways of setting it up to be efficient mm -hmm. and effective. And so I'm a, I'm a regular SaaS company, um, you know, say B2B SaaS. We work with with you know businesses all over the world. How often should I be backing up? Um, you know, how long do I want to keep my records for? I mean, just maybe share some things that how I want to set it up to be you know optimized. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that because yeah, okay. that answer should be business, it should be mm -hmm. based on your business, right? Sure. Um, and the retention requirements of, let's say, a law firm are different than, than a storefront, right? Mm -hmm. Every business is different in terms of how long you should be keeping the data. Uh, I will just say, it, again, my, my opinion mm -hmm. is that backups should be kept generally unless you've got a regulatory reason I think they should be stored for about a year or so, year. right? Um, if you've got regulatory reasons to store longer, then you can do that. Um, you know, people that store their backups for 10 years without a reason to do so, I don't understand why they do that. Because <laughs> you open yourself up to lawsuits, right? Because if, you, if you're if you sued and they ask you for data in that backup, you have to provide it. Right. Um, but in terms of frequency, um, you know, I, I would say as often as you can, <clears throat> reasonably, right? When you look at the way Druva works, it's a block level incremental forever. So doing um, one backup a night takes the same amount of effort as doing 24 backups once an hour because okay. it's, it's block level incremental backup each time. So that if you do the backup every hour, the backup is really, really small. And so right. it only takes like a couple of minutes. If you wait until the end of the night, it takes longer you see what I'm saying? It's the same amount of effort. Right, right. It's my, also the my, difference that they're making. Yeah. 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 My opinion would be to do as, as often as you can okay. within the support of that of that tool. Hmm. Um, as long as it doesn't impact your production, right? Production, exactly. Um, but yeah, but the retention, that's a much, much more challenging question, which would have to be based on the business. No, oh, cool. I like that. I think that's a good rule of thumb, though. At least, you know, one year seems to be the right the right way where, you know, enough, enough changes and enough uh, can happen that you're, you can, you can go back to, you yeah. know, cool. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thanks for, for that. I think our, our audience will learn a lot from that and they, they've got some good value. Uh, I want to shift gears to kind of the second part of the, the interview where we're going to the personal, more rapid fire question. So sure. Ready to, ready to go there. We're not talking about backup here. It's more about sure. you and yeah. yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> All right. Um, what's uh, one activity you, you enjoy outside of work that you say gets you into flow state? I'm going to say scuba diving. Scuba diving. Interesting. Love scuba okay. diving. Love it. I thought you were going to say, uh, you know, what was it? What were you doing? You were, you were doing some renovations? The DIY stuff? The yeah, DIY that stuff, doesn't yeah. get me into a flow state. That often gets me into an angry state, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I like I like doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the yin and the yang. You got to do the balance, the, the scuba diving yeah. to make up for the DIY work. Got it. All right. All right. And scuba diving, by the way, is one place where I go when I'm not talking. I'm not okay. talking. No one else is talking. You just sort of, you know, mm -hmm. just one with the animals, you know, lost with, lost with the water. Love it. Yeah. What's uh, one piece of advice, you know, obviously I have quite a bit of experience in almost 30 years in the space. What's one piece of advice um, you wish you had known? If you can go back, you would tell your 25 year old self. Uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, I would say l worry less about what people think about you and more about just getting your job done well. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think when I think about in my personal life, like backups, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's not, it's not something that I ever, you know, wanted to do. It's not something that anybody wants to do. It turned out to be a pretty dang good career, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I'd say the same. Yeah. Do what you, do what you, do what you say and what you need to do in the work, right? Less worried about other people's, you know, um, what are some of the biggest challenges you're currently facing in order to continue 
to to grow, Druva? I mean, what's is there anything that keeps you up at night these days? Um, you know, it, it's just that challenge of the mentality of that backups have always been data center, and then oh, if I do backups in the cloud, it's probably not going to work. Just being given that opportunity to explain why it's actually better. And by the way, not every customer is a Druva customer. I mean, like if you've got if you've got 50 petabytes of data and a T1 line, you are not our target customer. Okay. 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 It's just that yeah. you you can't you can't do that, right? The laws of physics still apply. Mm -hmm. But we can go a lot bigger than you think we can. That's probably the biggest challenge is people just sort of uh dismissing us out of hand before ever uh, having a having a conversation. Okay, maybe you know while you're here, why don't you share? You know, people listening in, what is the ideal customer? Who who do you work best with? Just so people listening in, they can see. If, you know, get well, not. you know, it, it's it's small to medium enterprises, right? SMBs as well as middle enterprises. It's not so much about the the number of uh, uh, employees as much it is about you know we we have customers up to like ten petabytes. Uh, actually more than 10 petabytes, but that okay. they tend to be very, if they're very spread out, right? Mm -hmm. If you're 10 petabytes in a data center with a <clears throat> a one gigabit link, right? It, that's not going to work, right? If it's a mm -hmm. 10 gig link and a 10, it's, it's uh, the ideal customer is a very spread out customer, right? Okay. The more spread out you are, uh, by the way, the more spread out you are, the worse you are for the other guys because okay. you're going to have to buy a box for every one of those locations. Us, you just put it in agent, magic happens. Right. Okay. So the more distributed you are and the more you're wanting to protect things like endpoints and cloud apps, uh, mm -hmm. then then yeah, because we protect the data center, the endpoints, the SaaS services, as well as the stuff in the cloud. Got it. Um, so you know, obviously you've had you know, qu you're quite knowledgeable. You probably absorb all this information from a lot of people or kind of books, a lot of uh, you know, people in the space. Who you who or what would you say are some of the Best three resources. These can be, you know, books or mentors or any people in the, in the space who you'd say have been instrumental to your, to your success over these last few years, and would suggest people listening in um, to also check out. Yeah, I, you know, one person that comes to mind. There's a guy by the name of Stephen Foskett. He has a company called Gestalt IT, and he works with people like who I used to be before coming to Druva, right? Influencer type people, uh, mm -hmm. and I. I he has such good access to really smart people and a uh, really good uh, company. I, I like that a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Book-wise, you know, I was thinking about that. And one of my favorites is still, there's, a, there's one called um, um, First Break All the Rules. It's a, it's a, good, it's a business book about that. I uh, don't want to go too much into that, but it, it's a great, great resource. And then an old but good and and has recently been updated is how to win friends and influence people. They yeah, updated it to to for the digital age. Uh, okay. I I recently reread it and they've updated all the stuff to to talk about email and social media and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Uh, I'd highly recommend if, if if you're familiar with the book, I'd highly recommend you look at the the updated version. Yeah, I did not know that. I think I read that book more than twenty years ago. So it'd be interesting yeah. to read it now and see what the what the changes are and how. If there's anything yeah. I can implement. Yeah, awesome. That's a great book. And the other one was First Break All the Rules. Is that the one? First Break All the Rules, yeah. Great, awesome. Okay, awesome. We'll add that to the show notes for people to check out. Um, what does success mean to you today? I mean, after 30 years of in this space, whether that's personally, business, financial, life, I guess there's no right answer. How do you define it? You know, I'm starting to get, I'm 56, I'm starting, starting to look at the retirement. So for me, success is uh, not having to, be a burden to my kids once I hit retirement. Okay. Right? And by the way, that's not not exactly uh, the easiest thing to do. I live in San Diego, right? Um, very expensive. Yeah. You know, a very expensive place to live and be and and own a house. I do own a house thanks to there, there's no way I'd own this house uh, if it wasn't for the VA. Uh, you know, I'm a veteran. Access to the VA oh, okay. loan. No right. way I would have been able to. You know, because when I bought my first house in California, zero dollars down. I mean. How can you how can you do that right yeah, exactly, yeah, without yeah. that right uh, yeah. so yeah so thanks to my my buddies at the VA uh, but yeah I'd, I'd say that be um, and, and you know and if you're young and you're not thinking about that stuff all I got to tell you is the sooner you think about it the easier it is mm. you know it's the whole thing of like putting ten dollars away a month uh, fifty years ago is better than putting anything away now right so right, right. yeah. 
you're at it. So the financial security and just being free from, you know, deciding yeah. that you don't have to rely on anybody, but you, what you built for yourself. Yeah. 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 Love it. Awesome. This, this has been, this has been really great. I appreciate you sharing all this and uh, great knowledge and wisdom from, you know, somebody very experienced in the field. Um, so if anybody's listening in founders or, 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 or marketers, or anybody in the space wants to get in touch with you, learn more about you or, or about your company, where's the best place to go? Well, first, uh, I, you know, I should have said that the best book to read is my book, um, Modern Data Protection. Um, you can you can get a free copy of it by going to druva.com slash ebook. Um, okay. My website is, you know, you mentioned it already, backupcentral.com. And my, my podcast there, the Restore It All podcast, we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. We have all kinds of different guests, including competitors of, of, of Druva because it's, it's an independent podcast. Um, and, um, and then it, you can also, I'm at WC Preston on Twitter. Okay. Awesome. We'll add all those to the show notes. So juva.com slash ebook. Uh, we have the restored all podcast and then also on Twitter. So awesome. All that, I'll add those to the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Curtis. I, pre- I appreciate you jumping on today. No problem. All right. Cheers. Thank you all for watching this episode and joining SAS District today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for future episodes where we interview top leaders in the SaaS industry. If you're a SaaS company looking to grow and unlock the true value of your business, get in touch with us at Horizon Capital and myself or one of our consultants will provide a free assessment to help you get there and hit your goals. If you have any feedback or suggestions for this podcast, please comment down below and help us improve our content for you all. Thanks again and see you on the next one.